Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, Chris, I'm Jane Clark. I'm the uh, attorney in Texas and uh, part of the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. And we uh, are uh, here to uh, commemorate and remember Christina Mor uh, Borgeson. And she was an incredible woman. Every time I knew more about her, I knew more things that she did so perfectly. And she was a personal friend of many of the board members for years. I believe she started with us in 2020 and was our private investigator first, and then she went on to be on our board itself. And then she started to help Richard with the film that we're producing now uh, called uh, Crime Scene to Courtroom. Uh, she was very instrumental, and she was the first producer of that report of that uh, documentary that will be shown at some point in time this year. Uh, she won many awards throughout her career, including the, an Emmy for her investigative journalism and the Edward R. Murrow Award, both uh -huh. on uh, CBS documentaries called Legacy of Shame and Harvest of Shame. She also uh, had her tenure actually at CBS, which is their loss. Uh, uh, they uh, ended her uh, contract there because she tried to tell the truth about TWA 800, and that was the midair collusion explosion of a 747 off the coast of Long Island, New York in 1996. If you want to see that film, and it's very important, we'll show you a trailer today, you can go to Amazon. It's very reasonable and it's definitely worth watching. She also started a group called the Whistleblower Newsroom, and we'll have a compilation of some of her interviews with them, the interviewees. She has been to Cuba. She's been to Haiti. She grew up in Haiti. She's been everywhere. This woman is just an incredible and fearless, and we miss her very much. So I'm going to, my co-host here is Charlotte Danette. Charlotte's known Christina a long time, and Christina was helping her with her attorney general campaign at one time in Vermont. And so I'm going to leave Charlotte, go ahead and give you, introduce yourself. Hi there. Hi. Yes. I'm Charlotte Dennett. I am a lawyer, a board member, an investigative journalist, and an author. What you're going to see is the amazing life of Christina Borgeson. She's so smart, so engaging. Christina was a genuine truth digger, which is why I loved her. And she was fun. She's hilarious. I'll say more about Christina in my five minutes. I just want to say that you're going to be amazed when you see all the excerpts from this woman's remarkable life. And I still can't believe she's no longer with us. It's very hard. But now we're going to play the uh, trailer for TWA 800. I couldn't really find another compilation better than the trailer that she created. And if you want to see that, again, it's on Amazon, really reasonably priced and well worth watching. Now, remember, she was the producer on this documentary, director and producer. We just had an explosion out there. Uh, it blew up in the air, and then we saw two fireballs go down into the water. On July 17, 1996, TWA Flight 800 exploded in the sky. A missile or some kind of streaking object was seen in the sky at the same time TWA Flight 800 exploded. I saw an object rise out of the ocean. It was moving very rapidly. And then it started climbing, passing my altitude, and the explosion. And the very next day, the FBI came to talk to me and said, you did not see that. You saw nothing. The TWA Flight 800 in-flight breakup was initiated by a fuel air explosion in the center wing tank. We didn't find any part of the airplane that indicated a mechanical failure. The explosive forces came from outside the airplane, not the center fuel tank. The FBI did all the interviewing of eyewitnesses. No witness was ever allowed to testify. For that kind of cover-up to be tolerated, it makes me fighting mad. TWA Flight 800, an Epic's original documentary. And then we have now a uh, video compilation that comes from the Texas whistleblower, Texas, sorry, <laughs> I love Texas, but uh, from the uh, whistleblower newsroom that uh, Christina hosted uh, for quite a few years and uh, some of the interviewees that she had on the show. We couldn't include them all, but we just took about eight and wanted to present those to you. 
Welcome to the Whistleblower Newsroom. I'm Christina Borgeson. As war in the Ukraine rages on and gas and food prices soar globally, it's instructive to look back at how the world finds itself on the brink, if not at the beginning, of World War III. War is always about getting control. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger once said, Control oil and you control nations. Control food and you control people. My guest today calls herself, quote, a pipeline tracker, unquote. Attorney, author, and investigative journalist Charlotte Dennett has spent decades studying the history of pipelines around the world as arteries for the distribution of oil and gas, the lifeblood of economies. She's also studied the constant conflicts surrounding them. But this war, says Dennett, could be the mother of them all. In this interview, she lays out the history of pipeline conflicts and the ruling elite's agendas behind them. Welcome, Charlotte. Hi. You have just written an article. My guest today has been on a thankless mission to expose the global child sex trafficking epidemic, including rings like that of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, who traffic children as part of a blackmail operation targeting the powerful. No major press outlet, says journalist Nick Bryant, seems to want to delve too deeply into this subject. To wit, after getting Epstein's Black Book of Contacts, it took Bryant three years to get any press interest in publishing it, and no press outlet has really investigated the related activities of any of the big names in that book. And clearly to date, no law enforcement agency or court seems interested in getting swift justice for the victims and real accountability for the perpetrators. Now, as opening day of Maxwell's trial nears, Bryant has gone beyond his role as a reporter to single-handedly organize an upcoming December 4 rally in Thomas Paine Park in New York City on behalf of Epstein and Maxwell's victims. He's here to talk about that today and the long, difficult journey that drove him beyond his role as a journalist to advocate for victims of trafficking. Welcome, Nick. I'm glad to be here this morning, Christina. We had a recent conversation and you said... As humanity rushes headlong into an ever more dystopian future, replete with wars, pandemics, food shortages, droughts, and ever larger populations of hungry, destitute humans filled with fear and living in chaos and violence, perhaps a new perspective would be helpful to understand how we got here and what might be done to improve everyone's circumstances. Perhaps, instead of examining the hard facts pertaining to evil acts, actors, and events, a different analysis is in order. Maybe it's time to look at the world from a spiritual perspective. With that in mind, my guest today is definitely a spiritual man and one of the most extreme whistleblowers on evil. Father Vincent Lampert is an exorcist. He blows the whistle on the devil and demons. In this hour, he discusses how Lucifer became Satan, how evil is purveyed, and can possess people. He also talks about how he does his job and explains how to avoid evil and what each and every one of us can do to make the world a less evil place. Welcome, Father Lampert. It's good to be with you today. I read two books in preparation for this interview. I read your book, Exorcism, the Battle Against Satan and His Demons. And then I read Father Malachi Martin's book, Hostage to the Devil, The Possession and Exorcism of Five Contemporary Americans. And I must say that I, I think exorcists are the ultimate whistleblowers, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you wrote in your book, it, it rearranged my whole thinking. When it comes to examinations of third rail issues, perhaps none are more dangerous than those done by historians who understand the importance of deep dives into the past for context. My guest today is one of Europe's most distinguished historians, well known for his bombshell book titled NATO's Secret Armies, 
Operation Gladio, and Terrorism in Western Europe. Dr. Daniele Gonzer's book is an expose of NATO, along with the CIA and intelligence agencies of other Western nations, collectively operating a terrorist criminal enterprise called Gladio to eliminate communism around the world during the Cold War. Has this criminal enterprise continued to exist up to today? Did it expand its activities to serve new agendas? What's past is prologue, Shakespeare wrote in The Tempest, and well aware of that, Dr. Gonzer has also looked into a more recent terrorist event, 9-11. He's here today to talk about how his research into Gladio brought him to the subject of 9-11 and what he uncovered. Welcome, Dr. Gonzer. Thank you very much for inviting me to your show. Contrary to what he's been saying for the last 10 years, radio show host Alex Jones of Infowars.com has admitted in court that the massacre of 20 children at Sandy Hook was not a hoax and that he believes it was, quote, 100% real. Jones is being sued for defamation damages by parents of Sandy Hook victims who testified that they received death threats and were harassed because of Jones's false claim. The two families are seeking $150 million for defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress. False sensational claims about what actually happened during major events involving mass deaths, like school shootings, do unfortunately abound, and when repeated often, embed in the public consciousness, sometimes triggering dangerous responses. Why is the truth so hard to get at? One reason could be that those responsible for preventing and responding to these atrocities are not eager to have their incompetence or negligence made public. That said, few in the press ever bother to try to get to the bottom of what really happened either. Only rarely do reporters seem to bother to read official reports and other documents pertaining to these incidents to dig out inconsistencies, unaddressed issues, and misinformation. Nor do they stay on the story long enough to do a thorough investigation. My guest today is the exception. Investigative reporter Kelly O'Meara has arguably covered and deeply investigated more school shootings than any other reporter in this country, if not the world. She's here today to talk about her ongoing investigation into the Uvalde shooting, where 18-year-old Salvador Ramos walked into Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, and killed 19 children and two teachers with an AR-15 rifle. So far, three reports have been issued on this incident, and so far, critical questions remain unanswered. Omira is here to talk about those reports and those unanswered questions. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, Christine. Let's talk about those three reports. Kevin Ryan, former site manager for the Environmental Testing Division of Underwriters Laboratories, is here today to talk about a 2009 case report by Mount Sinai titled Lung Disease in World Trade Center Responders Exposed to Dust and Smoke, Carbon Nanotubes Found in the Lungs of World Trade Center Patients and Dust Samples. This report led to Ryan's own 2011 article titled Energetic Materials as a Potential Cause of the 9-11 First Responder Illnesses. Mr. Ryan will share his thoughts about the Mount Sinai report's results and talk about what led to the conclusions he drew in his article. While working for Underwriters Laboratories, Mr. Ryan began to publicly question the laboratory's testing of the structural materials used to construct the World Trade Center buildings and the laboratory's involvement in the World Trade Center investigation being conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. He was fired for this. Since 2006, he has been the editor of the Journal of 9-11 Studies and has authored books and peer-reviewed scientific articles on forensic evidence linked to 9-11. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Christina. Right now, the whole world is on edge. 
Every day we're bombarded with savage, brutal images and words of conflict. It's also constantly shocking that it gets mind numbing, which in itself is disturbing. So what could possibly be discussed to make sense of it all? In this unexpectedly revelatory interview with Ray McGinnis about a book and follow-up article he wrote, we take the signature event of 9-11 right up to the door of today's prevailing madness. Ray's book is titled Unanswered Questions, What the September 11th Families Asked and the 9-11 Commission Ignored. And his follow-up article is 9-11, The Power Elite and the U.S. Think Tanks that plan the future. Welcome, Ray. Good to be with you, Christina. You wrote this incredible book, Unanswered Questions, What the September 11th Family Asked and the 9-11 Commission Ignored. Basically, what you did is through the questions that these suspicious family members who comprise the Family Steering Committee for the 9-11 Independent Commission, that would be the Jersey Girls, right? The Jersey Girls and, and eight others. It's been two years since Dr. Paul Alexander was pushed out of government as a scientific advisor on COVID for the Trump administration after a shocking run-in with Dr. Fauci and other members of government agencies managing the nation's pandemic response. Since then, Dr. Alexander has been part of a growing group of physicians, researchers, and medical experts working to expose the bad science behind key decisions made in response to the pandemic and to the dangers of the COVID vaccines. A growing body of studies and reports, as well as documents obtained from vaccine manufacturers are unfortunately confirming their worst fears. The interview you are about to hear is a retrospective look by Dr. Alexander at his six month experience inside the government's pandemic response machine and the searing conclusions he came to after having the time to digest what happened to him there? Welcome, Dr. Alexander. Thanks for having me today. It's a pleasure and an honor and privilege again to be speaking with you. You wrote an excellent... Christina went from the oil industry to sex trafficking, to the devil, to NATO, to 9-11, to COVID. And there were so many more fearless interviews that she's had that every time I spoke with her, I was amazed at what she was doing. So we have, besides this wonderful woman, we have her wonderful husband here to speak to us first, and that's Frederick, and Frederick, it's Laray, LaRue, is that it's correct? Laroux. It's LaRue, thank you, it's a French tongue twister. A French tongue twister. <laughs> and so Frederick, Laroux. go give us some information for you, and I'll, I'll start your timer. Uh, so good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's, let me thank you, let me thank all of you for giving time to Christina. Let me thank the Lawyers Committee for organizing this. For me to talk about Christina, it's hard because she had so many qualities. She was an amazing mother, limitless patience, limitless love and tenderness towards our two kids. She was a very good cook, one of those intuitive cooks that she just takes ingredients and mixes them up and something great comes out. She didn't follow recipes. She was quite athletic. I would say six, seven months ago, she was still running eight miles and letting me know about it. In her work, she worked extremely hard, but and extremely hard. But to me, that wasn't what was so special about Christina in her work. What was special to me was how she would be totally absorbed by any story that uh, she followed, any story she wanted to uh, report on completely absorbed, constantly drilling down to the, to the tiniest details on that story. And, and she was like that from the very first story. So her very first uh, work was a documentary on Thomas Merton. And you can actually see it on YouTube. She had just graduated from the Columbia Journalism School. She was in the late 20s. Um, she devoured every book imaginable on Thomas Merton. And she spent all of her time trying to figure out who she could talk to to get more insights into Thomas Merton. Uh, she would sometimes sleep, uh, quite a few times actually, she would sleep in the office, because back then we didn't have cell phones and she couldn't afford her own phone. So she had to go to the office and she had to call Europe and Asia and the various countries uh, where Thomas Merton was living. Um, 
she didn't earn very much. She, she, she couldn't afford her own place. So she was actually sleeping on the floor of her sister's tiny studio in New York City. But what was striking is how she was completely absorbed by the story. And I would say she wasn't even aware of the hardships, the hours. There was no separation between her, her, her regular life and her work life. And she's had that approach all of her life. When she went on later on to work on Harvest uh, of Shame, a follow-up to Harvest of Shame with CBS, CBS at the time uh, thought it would just be an ordinary sort of routine the show. Uh, Christina drove with a camera to the middle of nowhere in Mexico because she wanted to go to those tiny towns and see where the journey for those migrants began. And there were obviously no, no decent hotels in those areas. Uh, at, at some risk, she managed to get an interview with a coyote. And a coyote is, I imagine, one of those guys with the knife scars that take people across the border illegally. She managed to track two uh, Mexicans, two farmers from their city in Mexico to farms in uh, Florida. And she filmed the living conditions in Florida. Uh, and some of those conditions were appalling. Um, and, and I would argue that the Christina should be thanked for, Christina is responsible for the awards that were given to that show. She won both an Emmy and a Morrow for outstanding journalism. And I think it was thanks to Christina because she was the one who brought, through a lot of hard work and passion and dedication, she brought that texture, she brought that color, that, that depth that makes documentary special. For TWA, same approach, uh, she went out to Long Island to talk to people, and she actually managed to get a piece of a seat from the plane that she wanted to have it analyzed to see if there were explosive residues or any other kind of residue. Uh, unfortunately, CBS promptly gave it back to, to the FBI when they asked for it. Um, and she kept that approach all the way to, in a radio show, uh, all the way to a few weeks before she passed away in December. Um, she kept an exhausting schedule. She would read every single book that she talked about on her show. Uh, she would laugh at publishers who, who would send a book with a list of questions because she insisted on coming up with her own questions. Uh, sometimes uh, she had to read more than one book in two or three days, and, and we're talking hundreds of pages, but she insisted on doing that and did that, as I said, to a few weeks before she passed away. And, and thinking about it now, I, th I think that what's important here is that what drove her to behave that way were qualities that we all treasure. Um, excuse me. Intellectual curiosity, <laughs> honesty, just a wish to make the world better. These were qualities that Christina had, and I'm going to miss those. And you have two wonderful children, too, Thank you. from your marriage, Chris, Christopher and Isabella. That's correct. That's correct. And the thing I'll miss, I think, is also an influence on my behavior in life. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you for giving uh, your precious time. Thank you so much, Frederick. Thank you. And next we have uh, Hank Hughes. Hank Hughes is a uh, NTSB investigator, and he's really the origination of the documentation document documentary TWA 800 if it weren't for him I don't think it, anything would have gone forward but Hank go ahead and give us your background and give us a, your interaction with Christina yes ma'am thank you back around 2004 I received a package at work I was an NTSB accident, aviation accident investigator at the time and I opened this package and it was a book into the buzzsaw. And I thought, what the heck? It was about reporters and some of the, actually it wasn't about reporters, it was about journalists. And there's a distinction that I learned later that's very important, but it was written by Christina. And she wrote a, a very nice note in there that personally was very touching about. She went to a congressional briefing or hearing that I appeared in, and basically I stood up, raised my hand, and what brought you and to told, take you to Myers, the oh. same barber? Hello, that person's muted. Go Hold ahead. on, Hank. We're trying to get someone to. Uh, I got mute. okay. 
I, I had to testify before a Senate of the Senate Judicial Subcommittee before Senator Grassley, and basically it was about how the FBI and the NTSB were conducting the investigation. Now, I have a little previous experience, not quite 20 years as a counterintelligence agent in the Army and a Vietnam veteran, and 14 years as a police detective in Virginia. So I know what a criminal investigation is all about in intelligence work. I've had a lot of formal training and a lot of experience. Shortly into the TWA investigation, I realized things were drastically wrong. And I won't go into the gory details because Christine and I spent months doing that. But the, the point that, that surprised me was that she saw me testify at this hearing, and she had the intellect and the instincts to look further. She was one of the few people that stood up. Now, my career went right down the toilet after after testifying, and I knew it would. You have to fall on your sword sometimes. It's just the way life is. But when I got this message, I thought, gee, that was really sweet of her. Nice. I didn't know her. Never heard of her. And then a couple of years later, we ran into each other again. This time, I, I talked to her on the phone, and I was getting ready to retire. In the meantime, my conviction, especially on Flight 800, because it was so atypical, I collected every bit of factual information on the investigation that had ever been collected. And Christine and I talked about it, and in 2010, when I retired, because I, it had taken me that long to get the information, we started to talk a little bit more, and then gradually, we formed an investigative team and did the job the right way and reinvestigated TWA Flight 800 and factually showed that it was an explosion from outside the aircraft. It was not a defective uh, center fuel pump. In fact, that had never been a case in, on any airplane that has ever been exploded, ever blown up in, in aviation. But the thing that amazed me more than anything, when I first met her, I thought, she's a reporter. And then I realized what the distinction was. This lady was extremely intelligent, was really interested in what was going on, and she took the time to listen to what I had to say, and she wasn't afraid to challenge anything either. Uh, her intelligence and her intuition were incredible, and I started to realize, hey, I got a partner here. I got somebody that knows what they're doing, that knows how to develop a story. And we started to work together and build a team. And ultimately, we wound up with two of the foremost forensic pathologists in the country who volunteered to help out from my old team, Tom Stalkup, who was a physicist who worked on the case and did a, did a great deal of work. But the backbone behind everybody was Christina. Even to a point where there were several French citizens on board, and it was critical that we talked, let their families know what was going on, and talk to them. And I know during the on scene investigation, the NTSB and the FBI were not particularly hospitable to the French investigators, who were highly competent people. Christina wanted them to be involved, and we did too. But I can remember at that point in time, I had the pleasure of meeting Fred, Frederick, I should say. And I also had the pleasure of meeting Isabel, Christina's husband and daughter. We have been friends for several years now. Christina, Frederick, Chris, and Isabel are wonderful people. And I think we're all better because I'm an Thank old you, cop. Hank. I don't normally I don't normally get upset about things, but she had a wonderful family and friends and that we were all made better because she was in our lives. That's, we all that's agree. all I have to say. Thank you, Thank Hank, you. so much. 
Okay, next we're going to have Celia Farber. She's an investigative journalist and close friend of Christina. I miss her every day. I really love Christina. And I think about her often every time I encounter a situation or a fact, which is almost all the time, uh, that's outrageous. And I want to, and I, and my mind still says, send that to Christina, or I want to talk to Christina about that. There's so many things that have been going through my mind. I think I first want to say beyond the epic, titanic, amazing journalist, she was such a great friend. I wasn't one of Christina's friends who we were always close or we always talked and we had long periods of not even being in, in touch, but many times throughout the year, I think I've known, I knew Christina maybe five years or so since we came together on a panel that was about journalism. You could say it was about journalism. It was about doomed journalists whose stories blew us out of the profession, no pun intended. So for Christina, of course, it was TWA. For me, it was Robert Gallo's so-called AIDS virus. Another colleague of ours told the truth about the drawing a blank, Matthew Shepard, the Matthew Shepard case. So the panel, it was Mark Crispin Miller at NYU, and we were all there because Mark had this idea, which was a great idea. To, he wanted to teach his students what really goes on in the media. And when I saw that Christina had been my, I guess you could say hero for probably 10 years prior to that panel. And when I tried to tell my story about what had happened to me following publication of an expose of the Tony Fauci apparatus in Harper's, I was still so traumatized and I had a really hard time being linear, which I always do. <laughs> and after it was over, I sat down and Christina, who had been sitting, she came around the front of all the tables. She came over to me and she just, she said, come here, I got to give you a hug. And so that was, that was the beginning of our friendship. And we did a, I'm sure I'm running out of time. We, You're fine. We had a, sh for a while, we began the whistleblower newsroom, which was her brainchild, her baby, her concept at PRN. And this theme that people have talked about how Christina would read one or two books in preparation for a show. The, the simple truth is that I could not keep up with her. The way her discipline, her mind, her grasp of the facts, it was absolutely astounding. And what I've been thinking as I've been listening is that I want to, one thing I can promise everybody here is the work she did is still there and really should be put forward and pollinated and kept in the world. I feel yeah. like she and I were escapees from the same dangerous cult and that cult is mainstream media. And we were in this kind of field where it, it what happened to Christina, the fact that CBS conducted itself like it did and she had it is an abomination that somebody of her caliber should not have been gainfully employed. But then again, if she had been gainfully employed, it would mean that she was one of them instead of Christina. And the toll that it takes, the toll that it takes to be that figure and carry that story. The last thing I want to say is I realized recently when I read an in, I was I read an interview somewhere with Christina and she was talking about the moment when she believed that uh, Christopher had been on that plane on TWA and that there were was a few minutes before she found out that he was safe. And in all the time I knew her, I never quite appreciated how profound, even if it was just a few moments, that must have been what actually really merged and bonded her with that story and I it's just such an extraordinary she it's such an extraordinary tribute to her that she most people would run away from it I would I would say I don't want to think about that ever again that's too traumatic and that was Christina instead of avoiding or or protecting herself she went straight in and she stayed there and every time I really needed a friend I had all kinds of crises and things and then can I come and my my cat and this and that. always she said where are you I'll come get you and Fred was also endlessly gracious and Isabel I never got to meet Chris yet but 
what a beautiful family. And she loved her family so much. And uh, yeah, God bless her. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Let me go ahead and then get to Kelly O'Meara. And he's an investigator and in the mental illness drugs given to school children. That was her interview with Christina and has many other traits that are wonderful. Hi to all of you. I'm happy to see some faces of people that Christine has uh, talked about over the years that I heard many stories about all of you. It's a pleasure to finally see you and get to hear your words of uh, your relationship with Christina. I met Christina when I was chief of staff to Congressman Mike Forbes. He was the congressman from the first district of New York where the TW-800 plane went down off our, our district. I remember he came in two days after it happened. He said, why the hell are you investigating this? Um, I really didn't want to investigate it because I just finished an investigation with the Navy and it was a horrible strain on my life. But needless to say, I did. I started investigating TW-800. We got a lot of calls from our constituents about what they saw go up in the air. And uh, this Japanese reporter, his first name was Yoshi. I don't remember his last name. He came in to interview me and he said, oh, you need to talk to Christina Borgeson. Um, she's a, a reporter for CBS and she's uh, investigating it too. So I tried calling Christina. He gave me her number, but uh, she apparently didn't want to talk to anybody in government. <laughs> That's what her... <laughs> so anyway, I stuck after we finally did connect. Uh, in a very big way. And so Christina would come down to D.C. and I had the blessings of my crazy congressman. He was psychotic. But anyway, he gave me his blessing to work with her. So we were trading information. I had information coming in from the Pentagon and federal sources. She had information coming in from on the ground cops and FBI there out on Long Island. Anyway, we worked on uh, TWA very early on. And in fact, I'll tell you a story. She went to, out to the hangar with me. I went out to the hangar uh, with the chief of staff in Long Island, Diana Weir, to, to see the, the, the mock-up of the plane. I thought, well, I'm going to investigate this. I better see what it looks like and so forth and so on. And I picked Christina uh, up in Jersey and we drive out to Long Island. That was quite a story in and of itself. We think we were followed. Somebody broke into my car, stole all my documents. Anyway... So anyway, we get out to the hangar and I was going to have Christina just sit in the car because she didn't have approval to go in. And the chief of staff in Long Island said, no, just have her come up. Typical New Yorker, have her come up. They don't want her to come in. Eh. I said, OK, we go in and Christina's got her passport with her. And so the FBI lady lets her in. And so we're walking around the hangar looking at everything. And Christina starts asking questions. <laughs> and next thing you know, the FBI guy is out making a phone call. Needless to say, when I got back to D.C., the FBI had called my member of Congress, and they were none too happy that I brought Christina into the hangar. And I said, this is not a big deal. She told them who she was and gave them the passport. And, <laughs> and they, she's, they've got a two-inch thick file on her, meaning Christina. The FBI has a two-inch thick file on Christina. And I went, okay, what's the big deal? Anyway, I told Christina this, and she just laughed. So anyway, Christine and I, I lost my job on Capitol Hill because of TW800 <laughs> and uh, Christina lost her job at CBS and we got hired by Oliver Stone to do a documentary for ABC and that was quickly squelched by the powers that be. They didn't want that to happen, even though Christine and I had already started filming interviews out on Long Island, which were heart-wrenching to tell you the truth. Some of these people's lives were just destroyed. Anyway, it, what's amazing between Christine and I is over the 30 years that we've known each other, almost 30 years, I miss her terribly. I can tell you, I get up every morning looking at my email, wondering where is Christina's email going? Hey, Kel, what do you think of this story? Because it'd be like, sister walks down the street with brother's head. <laughs> and Christina would send me this stuff and go, what do you think, Kel? Because um, I'm really into the whole psych drug issue. And uh, so I miss getting those emails from her. I like to think of Christina as part of our tribe. We are a very small tribe of warriors, we investigators. And I feel like I've lost, <clears throat> we've lost one of our very important tribe members and I miss her as you all do. Thank you, Kelly. You have anything else? Other than that, I think it's interesting that at some point, I'd love to talk to Celia about 
your investigation about Gallo, because Christine and I uh, talked about it often, you and I hooking up because I interviewed Gallo about his discovery. Um, this is the other thing Christina did. She brought people together, okay? And it was because of her that I met Dave Hendricks, the editor of the Press Enterprise. And then I got a story called Promise Software. And I investigated Promise Software and did a four-part series. And in fact, now there's going to be a documentary coming up on February 28th on Netflix about Promise Software. She would connect us all together. And I thought that was one of her greatest traits too. She shared everything. And I miss her and I, I love her. And Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that five minutes is over. Uh, let's go now to Denise. Are you on the, are you here, Denise? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go, go ahead. And you've got your daughter here too. So I guess you both could do a, a discussion if you want to about your, how you grew up with her, correct? You're with yes. Christina? So, so, yeah, I would first like to thank the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 inquiry for organizing the Sioux Memorial and Jane for giving me the opportunity to speak about my friend Christina. Um, I met Christina in the 1980s when we were both working in New York City <laughs> in the fashion business. She was in the communications department and I worked in the advertising and marketing department. But way back then, we were in our early 20s, it was plain to see Christina's remarkable capabilities. When her boss went on an extended maternity leave, Christina single-handedly ran the entire department without a glitch, even it was a new job to Christina, but she had to handle the whole thing. We became apartment mates, friends, confidants. We were friends for 43 years and we supported each other, we cried, together, laughed together, and most importantly, we respected each other. We were each other's go-to people. Our doors were always open to each other. I wanted to mention that a lesser known fact about Christina is that she is part of Robert Shetterly's Americans Who Tell the Truth Portrait Gallery, in which he sits among other truth tellers such as Edward Abbey and Susan B. Anthony and Cesar Chavez. And she posed for that portrait and was interviewed by Mr. Shetterly in my home. So that was a very poignant moment for me. Um, many times, Christina would discuss her stories in progress with me and the challenges and obstacles that she faced to get to the bottom of things. And I asked her so often, Christina, why do you still forge on? Why do you still do this? It's so hard. And she would reply that she could not stand for not only the injustices which occurred, but the unaccountability of the people who were responsible for them. This she felt was her life's work. And she was also a great mom. Uh, shortly before her death, she told me how happy she felt that both Christopher and Isabel had excellent education and career experiences. And she told me that she was very comfortable in knowing that they successfully launched. So those were her words. I'm so happy that they are successfully launched. And I just want to say she was immensely proud of them and their respective life choices. Deanna, do you want to chime in on how much our whole family is, is going to miss her? More than words could, could say. And Deanna, Deanna's uh, her daughter, and she's in Turkey right now. We appreciate her being up this late. So go ahead, Deanna. I'm not good on the fly, and I was asked to speak on the fly, so I just wrote something quickly. Um, and Excuse me. So Aunt Christina would always say that if world leaders had a massage once a week, the world would definitely be a better place. I got a massage today and I got that extra half hour, which I knew she would have, I knew she would have encouraged me to have done. 
So yeah, as my mom said, Christina was the best friend and surrogate sister to my mother. And she was the friend who not only would push my mom to be honest with herself, but would always be down for a good time, to loosen up, to have a good meal, to have a good laugh, a hearty laugh, and a good dance. She also Armenian danced with our family. She was loyal. She was critical. She knew every detail of our family history so that when I'd call her to just unwind, Christina would know how to break down the whole family play, play by plays of all the dramas. And she used to say, this is the, Diana, this is the thing you've got to understand about your mother. I think that she probably knew my mom the best out of all of us in the family. Christina was the friend who would drive up in the middle of the night when you were in a crisis, the person who you'd obviously have lots to, who would obviously have lots to add to the upteenth garage sale that my mom would be organizing in the yard and be there to set it up every single time. I don't know how the two of them would always do that and have stuff also to put in the, those garage sales. She was always the person cleaning up the dog poop or the one with, with impressive speed washing the dishes after every one of the family Christmases. Never afraid to get her hands dirty. In fact, always getting her hands dirty. The person who'd then come and take over the room with her laugh, with her wit. And then with her intellect and historical breath telling you how the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad was one of the precursors to the fall of the Ottoman state or what was going on in the State Department that week. Grounded, deep, real, fearless, passionate, and Christina ta taught me how to speak truth to power. She taught me the unconditional loyalty and boundless love and compassion for the story less told. She taught me the importance of digging deep to give context, to know the critical details no one else asks and give others the space to tell their stories. It's really wonderful to see all of the faces that I've heard about in our extended family over over all of these years here honoring her and to be with Christopher and Fred and Isabel, my extended family. As Fred said, Christina was the best chef, pork in particular for the holidays. Aunt Christina's door was never locked. It was always open. And I know not just for me, but for many of you here, a safe and unjudging space to rest your head. And now she's resting hers. Thank you, honey. For being just on the fly, you did wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next we're going to have a uh, videotape by Dr. Merle Nass. Richard, if you'll play that, she couldn't be here. And so she wanted to express her regrets that she's gone. Christina Borgeson was one of my favorite people. I first knew of her almost 20 years ago when she edited and partly wrote this book, Into the Buzz Saw, which is an extraordinary book about her experience investigating the crash of an airplane in Long Island Sound, which was probably due to a military naval exercise gone awry. And she basically lost her career in mainstream medicine as a result of her deep dive and reporting on that. And she collected almost 20 other stories of journalists and others. There's a DEA agent in here who also tried to do the right thing, dive deeply and were punished for doing so, generally losing their careers and sometimes more. Now, I didn't know her personally, I only know she had created this book. This book was really, I tell people, and it's hard to believe, but it was life-changing for me because even though I was an activist before, the book actually tells you the mechanics of how the censorship works and, and how the drug running works and the DEA's connections to the CIA, et cetera. So it was a level of intricacy I was not familiar with. I then got to know Christina when she was an investigator for 
the for your group, Richard, the the anthrax investigators from the lawyers 9-11 committee. And I provided them information and uh, worked with them. And then after that, I knew her as a journalist who interviewed me on several occasions about biological warfare and, and COVID related issues. And she was a marvelous journalist. And she was a very warm hearted spirit, as well as being very capable, hardworking and just a joy. It was just a joy to do an interview with her. I did not know she had cancer. I was shocked when I heard she died. And I hope her family is able to get over it. Because when you have someone in your family who's so wonderful, it's much harder when they go. So I wish her family and everyone who knew her, she's in a good place now. And I hope that you can be also. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Charlotte Danette, who is on our board of directors, an attorney in Vermont, and she'll be speaking. She's known Christina a long time, too. Go ahead, Charlotte. Hello, everybody. I'm so moved by your testimonials. Glad I'm finally getting to meet some of you because I heard so much about you. Uh, my my deepest uh, condolences to you, Fred. Haven't had a chance to talk, so hello under sad conditions. There's so much, I don't know how to cover it all. So stop me if I go too far. I'll try to keep uh, within the time limit. I met Christina through this book, Into the Buzzsaw. And she first uh, interviewed my husband, Jerry Colby, about how his um, book had been suppressed, uh, his book on DuPont Behind the Nylon Curtain, and then his book on Rockefeller. Um, Thy Will Be Done, which I worked with him on. It was about Rockefeller ev evangelists uh, and um, the genocide of Indians in the Amazon and, and Rockefeller. I just want to read. I had a piece in here because we got talking. She said, oh, I'm going to put you in the paperback. So she did. And I just want to say that here's the paperback edition. Well, I don't know if you can see it. But anyway, I can't begin to express how meaningful it is that we that I had as a friend, a champion of truth diggers who had suffered herself from the buzzsaw and began to wonder how many other people have been in, impacted this way. And the result was this incredible book that well, won awards. It's <clears throat> National Press Club Arthur Rouse Award for Press Criticism and the New York Public Library is one of the most extraordinary titles of 2000. Um, I just want to read you what the dedication is. This book is for the American people who need to know, aspiring journalists who need to know. That's aspiring, working journal working journalists who should know. This book is dedicated to those who fight and sacrifice to keep America's press free. It's a treasure, and I hope it'll be read for many years to come. The next interaction I had with Christina was when I ran for attorney general in Vermont on the progressive ticket. And my main platform was that I would prosecute Bush for sending our, our troops to war on a lie. And uh, it, it was just an amazing experience. She came to Vermont and uh, she was my press secretary. Uh, I called her my girl Friday because she would do everything. She would cook. Uh, she would clean up. Uh, Vincent Bugliosi, the famous uh, criminal attorney who wrote his own book called um, uh, Prosecuting Bush for Murder, <laughs> um, she took care of his laundry. She was just such a genuine person. And I want to read, I wrote a book about this experience. Of course, we lost. We, we only started on this campaign in September before the November election. But Vermont was very anti-Bush because of the war in Iraq, the illegal war in Iraq. I just want to read a little section from the book I wrote then called The People Versus Bush. Um, <clears throat> Christina lined up the interviews and answered as, quote, an advisor to Charlotte Dennett, what seemed like an avalanche of emails. The number of negative comments were tiny, but when they came in, Christina was ready for them. Her son was a Marine, trained to be a pilot, 
no one was going to outpatriot her. And then I have a footnote and it goes into greater detail about how proud she was of her of her husband, the Marine, and that, but by the same token, she said, if you have a child in the military, the United States is not more safe. The Bush administration not only did not protect Americans from 9-11, even though the president was warned, the administration has done more to create terrorism and hatred against America and Americans than virtually any other administration in modern history. Now the entire world is more dangerous for American citizens, and here at home, our civil rights and privacy have been severely curbed. That was back then. Look what we have endured since then. Anyway, um, another thing that happened is that we were both on the West Coast. Uh, we were uh, attending a conference on, on researching corporations and government accountability. And afterwards, they said, look, here's how you do it. Now, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Go out there and make change. And we came up with this idea of a declaration of accountability. It was based on the Declaration of Independence with the preamble and then a, a bill of grievances. So I dug through my files and here it is. I, maybe I can get it up on the website as it was finally done. But anyway, when governments cease to serve the will of the people and choose instead to serve the interests of powerful elites who hold themselves unaccountable to the rule of law, it is, upon, it is incumbent upon we, the people, to shed all allegiance to these institutions and reaffirm our long cherished inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what, that's what Christina was for. That's what so many of these journalists were for. I don't think the American people have a clue to how many journalists have suffered from censorship, the higher up they go. So anyway, I have a file this thick of our group, this thick, it's an inch thick of going back and forth and how we're gonna frame this declaration of accountability. And you know what happened? Obama got elected and then he said, we can't go backward, we have to move forward. We were all part of the impeachment movement. Then it was the prosecute Bush movement. And then Obama says, forget about it. We got to go forward. And that had a serious impact on this swelling movement for accountability. Um, but one thing that Christina did is she was drawn into the investigation into 9-11. And um, she had all the books. She would Sometimes she'd bring all the books to me. We smelled a rat from day one, both of us. We started talking about it and we kept talking about it. And uh, that was always a joy, talking to Christina, trying to get at the truth just between us and then deciding what can we put out there and how are we going to get it out there? Just a couple of just a couple of personal things. Yes, she was wonderfully hospitable. Her family was wonderful to Jerry and me. Whenever we traveled south, we stayed. They, Christina always made us breakfast and dinner and so on. We had wonderful conversations. Jerry had good conversations with Fred and we, we met the kids and yes, a wonderful family that she had. Um, let me see what else I can remember about her. Oh yes. Uh, she's very funny, right? Uh, she was a great cleaner. I, th I think Christina worked out her stress by cleaning things. And when she came up to my place, she, she had plenty to do. <laughs> and one of the things that she did is she cleaned my refrigerator? Yes. And she also introduced me to this metal scrub thing, which I still have. And whenever I scrub the dishes, I think of Christina. She is just so much fun, so brilliant, so intelligent. And I guess I've gone over. Thank you. <laughs> you know yourself. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Charlotte. And uh, now we're going to have uh, Richard Gage who is involved with her on the movie. 9-11 crime scene to courtroom. Christina was immediately enamored with the idea of justice. The lawyers committee for 9-11 inquiry of which she and I uh, were on the board. I still am. Uh, we had submitted 
on behalf of the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth and uh, many other organizations, 60 exhibits to the U.S. attorney, exhibits showing the explosive demolition of all three World Trade Center skyscrapers on 9-11. And the years went by and we collectively sued them under the great direction of the litigation director for Mick Harrison. But we all got our together. And Christina just launched forward and took the lead. And she says, this has to happen. This film series in which each episode highlights one of the specific examples of a couple of dozen key points, evidence, and eyewitness testimony. And she says, it has to be a fight. She told us how to make a story out of this film series. She's a story writer to make this palatable to the public. And in this case, to the grand jury, because this film series was designed to be given to a special grand jury in lower Manhattan and now probably Washington, D.C. So we're not stopping. We're carrying Christina's vision, who actually ended up naming this film 9-11 Crime Scene to Courtroom. She brought it all together. She says it has to be a fight against NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology whom she took on in the early script writing to find as much evidence and asking me all these questions I'd never even thought to ask. She really was extraordinary. And this film where we filmed it in Washington, D.C., Mick Harrison and myself, and we are adding, we filmed also about two dozen expert witnesses, and she would tell us which expert witnesses would be the best to go into this evidence, this story for the grand jury. We're now editing that film, and I think of her every time I open up my editor. That's what I wanted to share with you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Richard. And we, I think we have a uh requests here and that we have a, a request here to I know the film was important to Christina and we need probably need to look at dedicating it to her but we should also discuss that I think she would like people to donate to the film project because it was one of her babies at first until she got where she couldn't do it any longer because of her health. Barbara you want to come on? I'm the chairman of the board of the lawyers committee for 9-11 inquiry and uh, Richard's on the board. Uh, so many of us here are on the board. Um, Jane Clark is our executive director. She's the co-founder with Mick Harrison of the organization originally. So Richard and I worked out to, to give a heartfelt request to do what Celia said. So earlier in her presentation, Celia said how important it is not to lose the work that Christina did. So the first thing we're going to ask all of you who are on this, and there are I think 75 wonderful people who have come here today, whatever you can donate, it would be for two projects and they would both be for Christina. The first one is her husband, Frederick, who opened, was the very first speaker today. Frederick wants to, and will, I know, do a new website where not only Christina's interviews, I think she did 75 or 100 interviews for Whistleblowers Newsroom at a minimum, not only to put all of those on the new website, but also everything else about Christina and all of her other projects, her book, her bio, etc. We need to get a webmaster for that, and there's some upkeep to have a website for the host, uh, the platform host of the website. So that's the first request for donation. And the second request for donations would be, as Jane just said, Richard Gage has this wonderful idea that we really need a new website just for the film project that Christina was not only the investigator for, but she was the original producer and director and named the film. So in her honor, we would dedicate the that website, the second website to her. And it would be for everything about the film project, the progress, 
video clips, from the interviews with experts, et cetera. And so we're requesting 50-50 that anybody who can donate whatever you can go to the Lawyers Committee website, which is lc911.org. LC4. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for the correction. LC4, F-O-R, 911.org. And it won't be long. It's not there yet. But we will have a way for you to uh, identify that you're uh, donating for the website for Christina's new website that uh, her husband Frederick is going to be working on and also for the new website for the film project that she was so dedicated to and basically ran <laughs> with Richard. In so, fact, she wanted to have a website to go along with the film so that we could enrich our experience and engagement with the public and those people who have access to material witnesses that we could provide to the jurors to bring forth more information. So this is a new uh, phenomenon. In addition to the film, where we're actually inviting the public to act as virtual grand jurors in this uh, episode by coming to the new website, uh, which is being made as we speak, 911crimescenetocourtroom.org. And she wanted people to be able to judge the evidence themselves and provide us feedback on how we're doing episode by episode so we could incorporate ideas into the next episodes. It's a live, interactive, iterative process that uh, she envisioned here. And so we'll be able to incorporate those changes and improvements real time. Uh, and also, I to... would hope to invite whistleblowers, new whistleblowers for 9-11. Yes, then that's the other point, too. She wanted us to re reach out to people who might be watching that, have more information. That's right, Barb. And share evidence and investigative strategies with our team. So all of that is a critical part of the film series, the website, which we still have to create. And of course, that takes time, effort, skills, talent, resources. And we so much appreciate your involvement in, in, in that effort, as well as the Whistleblower Newsroom website. This is all so exciting. And so again, about how long behind before... us and guiding it all. Go ahead, Barb. I noticed that Dick Pullman is here from Germany. Yeah, I got to know Christina. I never met her personally, I have to say. Um, we have been on the phone for 15 years, more than that. And <laughs> I got to know her during my documentary. Uh, Dirk, we, we need a little more volume from you. Uh, maybe just put that microphone in front of you. Yeah, mic. no, I'm close to it. Ah, so I can. That's much better. better now? Okay. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I got to know Christina about 15, 15 to 20 years ago when I was working on a documentary on spy flights in the Cold War. And during this documentary, I found traces of two people from an American crew who disappeared to Russia. And it's a long story to cut it short. I had evidence. They left information that could only be understood by somebody who could speak German and English. And because German prisoners of war were coming from Russia, that was a, a trace. And then I remembered when I did a documentary in 1999 that prisoners of war, German prisoners of war in Russia told about British and American people, British, uh, they played soccer with them and some black Americans who definitely were not Russian. <laughs> they were talking about that. I started to investigate that and via that I got to Christina Voyerson because she's working, she was working on the same topic. And I did two documentaries for German French TV on that which has also been aired internationally. And I, I have to say what Mrs. Amara said, uh, I have the very same, this is what I told her husband yesterday, that I think we were the guilt, an international guilt. There were other people in other countries and we know each other. And we know that we are very similar to each other. We are more similar than people from, let's say the same nation that you have or so. It's something where, and Christina was about the truth. And uh, I can relate to that. Uh, I worked very hard to get into mainstream media and be a successful documentary filmer. And while doing that, I destroyed my career because I couldn't unlearn what I've learned. And then the truth was detrimental to the career at some point. And I got to know her book, 
Into the Bus Saw, which described that. And it's a wonderful book. And Christina was, as I said, about the truth. I consider her something like a knight, a female knight. A knight always had to speak truth, even if it would cost his life. And you had battles. She had scoops. She had won battles. And she had scars. And that's what contributes to the full personality then. I wanted to have her as somebody who would pick young people to become journalists. She should have been at the top of any journalistic association because her strong will and her really naive will will to be to go to the truth is just what her biggest quality was. And I would define truth as the truth is what is left if you delete all the lies. And then the truth can have different perspectives. It's not one thing. You, people, different people will find different angles. But I could talk about any issue with Christina because I always knew she was going straight for that. She was not somebody who had a political opinion that she was always willing to look around and find out things. So she was, in a way, for me, she was uh, the best journalist that I've met in the United States. I would say that. Yeah. So she was really an inspiration and it devastated me to hear that she died and i won't accept that i tried to find a way to stay in contact with her somehow that's <laughs> my plea and you had a great friend i had a great friend and i will never forget her she will always be with me until i die that's it thank you dirk okay uh, go ahead okay <clears throat> well christina the first thing i wanted to say is that Christina was a karmic force. If you were lying to yourself, especially if you were in officialdom and you were lying, she was ruthless. But she was ruthless with love. Now, I don't know. Can you see this? I don't know. Pull it back <laughs> toward you. Pull it back toward you. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, in the middle. Well, it's in the called middle. Feet to the Fire. It's her other main book. She's written more than these two books, Into the Buzzsaw, but Feet to the Fire uh, is her book about the media after 9-11. Uh, and of course, we're the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, and she was a dedicated board member, uh, for a while the uh, director of investigations for our organization. I met, I'm not someone who knew Christina for many years, but I met her in 2005. As I recall, it was around Christmas, right after Christmas of 2005 at a conference in Santa Cruz, rather ironically titled something like Breaking 9-11, Breaking Through to the Mainstream Media. So you can imagine Christina had just written Feet to the Fire, the media after 9-11, top journalists speak out. And of course, these are top journalists, including herself, who knew that the official story was a, a huge Hitlerian big lie. And so I was a speaker there and she was a speaker there. And that was my first experience with Christina. She was actually not at the podium um, per se. She was on a panel. But <laughs> when she spoke about this book and what she had uncovered, already in 2005, which was, as I recall, that was either the same year or just shortly before, about the same time that Richard Gage got the bug, <laughs> the truth bug for 9-11. I spoke there too. And I want to tell you what I spoke about because, briefly, because she came up to me afterwards and that's how our relationship was started. Um, she came up to me after my presentation which was on officializing 9-11 truth. It could be about officializing any truth. And the basic message that I gave that kind of gave her a light bulb, she told me, was that we're officialdom lies. Power requires lies. And I think Dirk just said, the truth is what is left after you've eliminated, it's almost the, the famous quote from um, Sherlock Holmes, right? When you've eliminated the impossible, what's left as uh, unlikely as it appears is the truth. My message at the conference was, we have to officialize the truth because official officialized information is a zero sum game. Those in the government, those in power, they just lie and they officialize the lies. 
So we have to find ways to officialize the facts. And what I proposed, and, and I gave examples from my own personal experience, to simply, believe it or not, when you find a witness, or if you yourself are a witness or a whistleblower, what you need to do, it's a very simple, inexpensive thing. All What you need to do, first off, is to go to a notary public. In California, where I live, a notary public is an officer of the state of California. Once you do a sworn jurid affidavit in front of the in front of the notary public and they officialize it with a stamp and they have a special stamp that says that you have sworn to the content they don't have to agree to the content just that you've sworn to it in front of them and of course they get your thumbprint with the ink and all of that and the signature and then they put a seal on it and they sign it and it's an official document it's extremely important to do that for all people who have critical information that contradicts the lies of officialdom because it's a zero sum game. And I just like to, and she came up to me with stars in her eyes and she said, that's wonderful. We have to do this. Now, I don't know if, I don't know if she'd already completed, I believe she'd already completed her work on TWA Flight 800 because her book, Feet to the Fire, which is about that, was published in 2004, excuse me, uh, Into the Buzzsaw was published in 2004, and Feet to the Fire was published in 2005, which was when we had, we were at the conference together in Santa Cruz on breaking through, 9-11 breaking through to the mainstream media, which we still haven't done, been able to do, but we're working on it. We're not going to give up. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention about Christina, because Dirk said this, that it's important to believe that you can still communicate with Christina. Now, what many people don't know about me is that I earned the first ever in the world, let alone the United States, accredited graduate degree in consciousness studies. And one of the, after years of this official this official academic program, I met a man by the name of Ingo Swan. And it was not long before Christina died that we were talking on the phone and we learned that we both knew Ingo Swan. Ingo Swan was a phenomenal psychic and she knew him personally. And she told me this story, Dirk. She said that as he was dying, he called Christina to his side. And he said to Christina, you see that plant over there in the corner? He called it Methuselah. And he said, you can communicate to me through Methuselah. And he gave, he willed Methuselah to Christina. So I'm hoping, Frederick, that you keep Methuselah alive and well, and maybe you could get a cutting somehow legally to Dirk. Uh, we actually, that one Methuselah has now given us like three or four Methuselahs all around the house. So yes. <laughs> that's doing very well. I would like a Methuselah. It's actually <laughs> taking over the house. <laughs> yes, they do. They grow. There are I ways promise to, to keep it. And yes, thank you very much for that. Uh, Gerard, go right ahead. Christina's death had a, a profound impact on everybody here, and I would say on me also. Uh, she was a friend. We participated together in the, Into the Buzzsaw, and over the years, conversed on many issues. I can only say that we're getting fewer and fewer people who have her courage and her integrity. And that is not easy in a country that is having less and less of courage out there when it's being hammered by the far. I had the privilege of meeting Gary Webb when we were all involved in the acceptance of the National Press Club Award. You probably all know my story about 
fighting the DuPonts and then later on finding also my publisher for the second book, HarperCollins, and the suppression of that book as well. It's not easy to keep going. I'm now trying to write another one. But it's people like Christina that give you courage to keep going despite the odds. And there's no doubt in my mind that the next book will be suppressed too. And I'm writing it into that suppression. It's a book on the origins of Israel and the connection to oil. Christina and I had many discussions, as you can, just like all the rest of you. I treasured her and I treasured my friendship with Fred too. I'll never forget when we were, I was just taking over the presidency of the National Writers Union when I was evicted from my apartment. And Christina and Fred came forward and offered me a place to stay. I stayed for maybe a little longer than I should have. <laughs> it was about a, almost a month, but I came back into the NW. You know probably that you can't have a position on Israel without and being critical without facing the anti-Semitic charge. And it, it's never dug, said to my face, but my support for the Arab American Writers Conference right after 9-11 just got the troops of the Zionist movement out and I had many Jew, Jewish friends who were very upset about what was going on, but not one of them had the courage to show up. But Christina always gave me support and always supported the work of other journalists as well. So we're returning finally to the last words of that in someone with integrity, not just about her work, but about the world and the role this country is playing in it. Then moves on to the question of courage. What do you do about it? Christina did something that very few people in this country do. She told the truth fiercely. So it was a great lesson for some of us, like myself, who feel too often that we fight alone. And I'm really glad to have participated in this and to meet you all. And Fred, my deepest condolences. Thank you. I'd like to go to David Meiswinkle next. Christina course will be sorely missed by everyone that's uh, come in contact with her. Listening to the uh, statements from all the people that have talked thus far, incredibly moving. I met Christine, oh. I believe she did a an interview of me. We lived in the uh, right. will... same area in uh, Middlesex County, in New Jersey. I believe she was in Sarahville and I was in New Brunswick. And I had been a police officer there, and I had been involved in a lot of uh, things to try and bring good government to that town. And I think that's when she first uh, found out about me and saw that later when I was the executive director of the Lawyers Committee. Probably the best day I had with the Lawyers Committee was when we brought her on and we could give her a, a full contract or contract. And that was the same day we brought one or could give our webmaster a contract. And we brought a new a new director on too at that time, General Kelly. And from my perspective as executive director, it felt like we were really starting to muscle up as an organization when we could hire someone of the caliber of Christina. And she was very eager 
she didn't, it wasn't like we were paying a lot of money. <laughs> we weren't, we were a nonprofit, but we paid what we could afford. And uh, we got our money's worth and much more. Uh, she was a, a premier investigator. We were, I saw Merle Nass talk before about the anthrax committee. Well, Christina was key in that anthrax committee because it differed a bit from the work that we did with architects and engineers. The architects and engineers had almost packaged uh, or put together a lot of evidence and the lawyers committee came along and, and packaged it for them in a way and presented it uh, in a legal form. But with the anthrax committee, that was totally new and that was all our work really and or putting it together. And Christina was a very important person in doing that. I don't think there was a time when I didn't, and I asked her many times to get a lead on someone so that we could interview them. And she would always be able to get the telephone numbers, even though they weren't maybe listed, and the the addresses. And we were always able to make connections with the people, even some people that didn't want to be connected to. But the number of the affidavits in the anthrax committee evidence, a lot of credit should go to her because she located the various people, including the colonels or used to work with Yosemarid at Fort Dietrich. She, her and I, we went up to New York at one time. It was really interesting. We had a lead on a, a, a crime that was being committed actually in the towers where supposedly people were being hired to, to weaken the columns and things of that nature. We tried to follow it up. And then we had a time with architects and engineers. And this is right when the lockdowns were beginning with COVID. One minute, Dave. And we had decided that what we wanted to do was to get this, this dust this from the 9-11, original dust from the towers up to a lab in Connecticut uh, for architects and engineers. So we did that, uh, Christine and myself, and a friend that she knew from the FBI. When we first met, it was interesting because we talked on the phone, but I met her in Washington, D.C. She invited me to a whistleblower conference down there. So now I'm down there talking with Bill Binney and Thomas Drake and, and Colleen Riley. And I was with the, the heavies as far as people that really told the truth. I think what came through here and for me was that she was a truth seeker and she put her energies where she said it. She put her money where her mouth was, her mouth where her money was, where she did it. Uh, she didn't just talk about it. So most respect to her. She'd be sorely missed. She was a real truth seeker. And that's what the news should all be about. The type of journalism she wanted is hopefully someday the type of journalism we have in this country, and we wouldn't have all these problems like we have with 9-11 and COVID and other things with the TWA incident. All respect to her, and thank you for having me here to speak on her behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Let's go to Mick Harrison. Oh, thank you, Richard, and I would ditto Dave's comments. And I don't know if I've ever been on a, a meeting with so many folks where so many folks spoke and I found absolutely nothing to disagree with. And this is one of those meetings. <laughs> I, in four years of working with Christina at the Lawyers Committee, I, I could see all these wonderful characteristics that you all have spoken to. So I won't be redundant, but I will say that it was my honor to know her and work with her uh, for four years. She could, did contribute greatly to our work, including the anthrax investigation and the film project. I'm very pleased to hear us thinking about dedicating the film project to her, which I would support. The only thing I would add is, because I think her life is obviously one worth celebrating, a life uh, well-lived. But what struck me in thinking about her contributions was, in addition to everything she did, was just thinking about what she might have done had we had her uh, longer and how she might have contributed to our work. Uh, we're thinking about a follow-on to the current film project, which is focused on the Trade Center, talk about the cover-up issues. And I'm pretty sure Christina would have been a huge contribution to that project had we had her. 
So now we're going to have to think about replacing someone who is irreplaceable. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Mick. We go to Lou Welge oh. next. Honored to be here with you guys. You guys are great. You're truthers. I'm urging everybody who values truth and integrity to identify as a conspiracy realist, educator, activist, truther, organizer, reader, socializer. It's a mouthful, but each of those words means something. The first two, of course, conspiracy realist, because it was, as we have surmised in the, these past decades, it was a clever CIA agent that wanted to discredit anybody who questioned the, the official lie of the Kennedy assassination. And I would, I would, I don't like to say that, I will recommend James W. Douglas's JFK on the Unspeakable. I'm just now reading it. The prologue would have me in tears. The introduction is what I just read aloud to my wife earlier. The chronology is full of facts I didn't know about the early 60s and how Thomas, Thomas Merton was mentioned at the beginning. He was such an inspiration to James W. Douglas. And I'm curious if he's still alive with us because we have so many heroes. One of mine is my friend Christopher Bolin at bolin.com. I think that, that people following in Christine's footsteps or in journalism and media don't want to be they don't enter the profession thinking they're going to become members of the fifth of a fifth column it will used to be the fourth estate right and uh, we're only as sick as our secrets and these lies that maintain i'm going to be running for school board in alachua county florida where the university of florida is and uh, my part of the platform is the uh, is consideration of how these big lies uh, uh, negatively affect the mental health of especially our children and again, honored to be a part of this tribute to Christine. I didn't know her, but I will be reading her book into the buzzsaw because I believe in bibliotherapy and when books are controversial, not just superficial issues about when parents should tell their children about the birds and the bees. These are superficial issues. The real issues is confronting the big lies that are perpetrated by the powers that be using the power of propaganda and Edward Bernays's uh, new technology at that time. And these Zoom, this Zoom meeting especially is very powerful and profound. And, and, uh, and I'd like you to, uh, co to get into a coalition with Charles Kovas in Melbourne, Australia. Tom, uh, th there's some people that are doing, uh, we've got a big crowd here, it's uh, 60 people. And Zoom meetings can, I don't know what the limit is on participants in Zoom meetings, but we need more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. We'll go to Chris Larour, Christina's son. Hi, Chris. But I just want to say thank you, Richard James, for putting this together, for the entire Lawyers Committee for putting this together. I want to thank everybody. An absolutely magical turnout for my mom. And it is incredible to see all these people. A few familiar faces out there. I do wish I had been able to meet everybody in person over the course of the years. And unfortunately, I was always in some other long lost, long lost part of the world. But it, it really is incredible to see this. And the words spoken about my mom have been absolutely touching to hear. For for me on, on the other side, it was watching my mom stay late nights with uh, many of which with a, a nice bottle of J&B on the rocks ne next to her and keeping keeping the magic alive. But seeing that dedication has absolutely impacted me and impacted the way I, I move forwards in, in my life. And I know it's also done that for my sister. And it's beautiful to see my mom's superpower, which was always you know bringing people together having that ability and this is just a microcosm of of seeing it i know everybody here has four five six other people they can all talk about how my mom brought them together it was absolutely a superpower of hers i again cannot thank you all for just how wonderful 
this turnout is and, and everything that you've said about her. And I, my promise is that with my daughter, the lessons my mom taught me on justice, on honesty, on dedication and loyalty, I'm absolutely will be continued and will continue to live on through her. And I will absolutely show her works and show her what it means to stand for oneself against some of the greater powers that can be and be a powerhouse in the world and make an impact real change on people big and small. Again, to everybody, thank you so much for this turnout. I do wish I could stay for a little bit longer. I do I, I do need to jump off, but I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. And again, thank you. Thank you, Chris, so much. And we'll go to Ted next. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, my name is Ted, and I'm usually pretty shy, but I just felt the need to say something about Christina. I had the opportunity to meet Christina back in July of 2023 to talk about my 9-11 experience. It was a very brief meeting with her, and it was very impactful. I felt very comfortable being around her, and she understood that it's difficult finding justice going against the government. And Christina made me feel less alone in that sense. Um, so Christina is a reminder to me that I should keep fighting and going forward no matter how hard the journey is. And lastly, I wanted to say, living in New Jersey, I wish I reached out to connect with her more often. It's a reminder that life is precious and we should treasure each moment with each other. Uh, my condolences to Fred and his family. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And I'd just like to thank everyone for being here. Thank you for their comments and for the love they're showing for Fred and his family and for Christina. We'll see her again sometime. I'm just not sure when. So if we can just play the pictorial and let's close at this time. Okay. Yes. So we'll leave you with uh, these wonderful images from Christina. Thank you.